And so the idea is if your model only has a billion parameters, then the number of weights that are going to do random things is smaller than a model that's a trillion parameters. So if you keep it smaller, then it's easier for you to control how it outputs things so that if there's some random stuff you don't want, you can filter it out at the later stages. But as you increase your model size, well, then there's more random stuff you have to filter out. So that's more work. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to Practical AI, everybody. My name is Jeff. I'm with Peter Lin here. Um, we are in our second season of Practical AI, and we're sponsored by Pocket AI. Pocket AI is a tool used to edit the weights of your model directly. With Pocket AI, you can prune over 60% of the weights in your model while increasing accuracy. Peter, uh, there was an art uh, article in Nature Magazine that I think kind of intersected a lot with what you and I are interested in and what we've talked quite a bit about, and that is small models. So I'll bring it up here, and maybe you can kind of tell us a little bit about what you saw in this article and what people are doing. Yeah. Basically, the, the paper is about researchers using the smaller models. So, for example, the Llama models, the ones from Microsoft and so on, that basically people are seeing benefit to using smaller models and running it locally on either their laptops or their own desktops. And they're using, you know, these models that are between one and like, what, 12 billion, right? So they're way, way smaller than the OpenAI ChatGPT models that are hundreds of billions or up to a trillion for like four, for a O one. And so for me, the interesting thing is, I think we're gonna see more and more people do this because a smaller model is easier to refine, tune and adjust and do things with fewer odd or unexpected side effects. Now the, I mean, there were tons of examples in this and, and every, every use case, it, it made sense, right? Like, I mean, here's one of them, pre preserving privacy. There's, if you're doing stuff on, you know, people's health records, for example, you just do not want that out in space. Um, there was um, uh, another one too, that I thought was interesting. And maybe you can explain the benefit. And that is um, you don't want the model to change because you kind of want the results of the inputs for the prompt versus the output, the result to be consistent, right? And if if chat GPT or whatever is constantly changing, uh, you've kind of you're kind of working with a moving target. Explain that a little bit and how realistic that is. Um, big model versus local small model. Right. So one key thing that people don't really, you know think about is GP stands for generative pre-trained model. So that first word is generative. And what that means is it's creating things, right? So first you train this base model that understands language, and then you train another model that can generate things based on that. And the generation part needs to be flexible enough that if eight people ask the same question, so let's say we're asking it, give me a restaurant recommendations for Los Angeles. You don't want the same answer for all eight people because that wouldn't be very useful. And so as part of that, the generative part of it needs to have built into it some amount of randomness. But that means that if you ask the same question multiple times, you're gonna get a different answer. And so that's currently a problem with using LLMs like GPTs. Right, because it's built into it this randomness. But for th business use cases, you don't you don't want just any old random thing, or at least if it does, it needs to be a finite list of things that it can output. It can't just be any old random response, because that'd be bad. So the bigger monoliths are going to have more randomness or more variation. And so yeah. one of the benefits that these uh, researchers and, and small use cases uh, can capitalize on is that the there might be a finite 
amount of uh, responses that could come from one prompt. Is that fair? But it's just easier because there's fewer parameters to worry about, right? So if literal you, parameters or figurative parameters? <laughs> literally, the prompt you give it goes through this model that's got a language understanding part and a generative part. And so the idea is, if your model only has a billion parameters, then the number of weights that are going to do random things is smaller than a model that's a trillion parameters. So if you keep it smaller, then it's easier for you to control how it outputs things so that if there's some random stuff you don't want, you can filter it out at the later stages. But as you increase your model size, well, then there's more random stuff you have to filter out. So that's more work. <laughs> yeah. Now it may be very, very clear uh, in this article and we'll, we'll, we'll post this article with this video that um, the, this allowed people to get local. They, they could go onto their own machine and they could run their model from their machine, um, which um, obviously has some some benefits um, from a uh, from a privacy perspective. Um, but you've also got um, the uh, ability to kind of work with the model. So it, you're doing stuff here in this space, right? Where you're actually editing the weights, the parameters specifically. Explain a little bit about what you've been doing from a small model perspective and, and um, you know, the benefits of having, you know, something much more, you know, much less big, but also right. on your own machine. So one of the biggest unknowns today is there's all these weights, it's doing things, and uh, most of them, most of the weights actually are just noise. It, it results in producing unreliable or, or inconsistent results that you can't explain. And by pruning the weights and by modeling, by looking at the actual weights themselves and comparing them, you, you could probably take a Boolean parameter model and reduce it by half. So now you've made it much easier to now filter out all the random stuff because you've just literally reduced it by a half. And so the amount of work you have to spend to control it and filter it was a lot less. So, I mean, in the future, I mean, already you can run small language models on the next iPhone or on a Mac or on the new AI PCs that Intel and Microsoft are pushing. So already we're getting to the point where models up to like one to five billion quantized down to four bit can run on a local desktop, laptop, tablet, or phone. So I mean, in the future, once we get really good at editing models, we'll need less and less hardware and it'll, it'll, it'll just be good in general because your battery won't die as soon because you're using less power. And the, you know, the other component too, is that these, like we've talked about quite a bit, these, these models do something specific, right? They can't do everything. Um, although there are 8 billion parameter, large language, mo large language models that do do quite a bit, right? The Mistral and, and some of these others have come out with, or even Llama 3, I think is this, this the small is what, 8 billion or something? Right. 8 billion. Mm -hmm. So you could run that and do quite a bit of damage, you know, in terms of just a general comparing to a general LLM. So they're, they're pretty powerful regardless, but if you get even super specific, like the guy that's doing the proteins thing, um, you know, he's, he's, there's a fine, there's a finite number of proteins perhaps on the planet. Um, and he's got an, an, an LLM or, 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 uh, some sort of model that's basically be, be able to output protein types, right? Right. So the, the the interesting thing is if you take the 8 billion model, it's trained on the internet. And does the researcher doing protein research need most of the knowledge that's in that model? I would argue no. A lot of it's garbage. A lot of it has yeah, nothing yeah. for him. Yeah. And you can prune that stuff out. You can identify what those weights are and prune them out. Now you've got a much smaller model because maybe 
really only 10% of the model is relevant to your use case. So like in the protein case, maybe only 10% is, is relevant. So now if you prune the 90% out, you can take that smaller one. So you prune the foundation model down to only 10%. You can now then do what you need to do easier because you've just made everything much smaller and easier. Yeah, less power, yeah. you know, you've got, yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, this is fun. This is a fun discussion. I'm glad to see uh, publications starting to, to hit this topic as well, because this is something I know you and I have talked quite a bit about. And um, the future has to get smaller because it can't get bigger. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, like Microsoft just said, they're going to go nuclear to power all their AI data centers because yeah. it's not a power. <laughs> yeah, I read somewhere that they're going to fire up Three Mile Island again. Yep. Great. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Uh, good, good topic, Peter. Thanks for the the insights here. Uh, feel free to like, comment, ask us questions. We will try to respond. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next time. Take care. Oh.